Our topic tonight is uh, Korea and the crisis of transition. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to have the ambassador with us. Uh, he's achieved uh, wonderful careers in academia and in government and in politics. He's, uh, he studied uh, at Seoul National University School of Law. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Emory University in Atlanta, his Master of Arts degree and his PhD in political science are uh, from Yale University. He taught uh, for a period of time uh, uh, at Emory and Case Western Reserve uh, before spending 20 years as professor of political science at Seoul National University. During those years, two decades, uh, among other things, he was uh, president of the Korean Association for, the study of, for, for Communist Studies. He was uh, on the executive committee of the International Political Science Association and was president of Korea's Political Science Association. His first uh, governmental appointment was as Minister for National Reconciliation. He also served as uh, an advisor uh, to the president for political affairs and he was deputy prime minister. Later became, uh, I should say, also served as Great Britain's, uh, as uh, Korea's ambassador to Great Britain during those, those years. Uh, he became prime minister in 1994 to 1995, and then uh, served in the National Assembly and head of the uh, then ruling political party for four years before becoming uh, ambassador to the United States. And it's in that capacity, of course, which we're absolutely delighted to welcome this evening. It's my enormous pleasure to present to you the ambassador of our great friend for a half a century, the Republic of Korea, Ambassador Lee Hong Koo. Thank you very much for the fine introduction, and I'm delighted to be here in Baltimore. This evening, I'll talk about my own country, Korea, mainly. But also, I guess, uh, through the discussion, we will uh, examine some of the common problems we face together in the world at the end of this century. Now, <clears throat> tomorrow, I think, uh, the Germans and others will celebrate the 10th anniversary of the uh, Berlin Wall coming down and the, uh, which brought the unification of Germany. Now we Koreans are somewhat envious of Germans because for nearly uh, four decades, Koreans and Germans felt that we are fellow sufferers of the, uh, the, the history. That is, as a result of Second World War, both Germany and Korea were divided. And we were searching for means to unify our countries. We didn't know when we were going to achieve it. But suddenly, 10 years ago, the Germans achieved the unification. Now, since then, a number of things happened such things as uh, dissolution of Soviet Union, and tremendous change in China, and so on. So people tend to get an impression that we now live in what you may call post-Cold War era. Not so for us, the people in the Korean Peninsula. We are still in the process of confronting each other in Korea between North and South Korea. In short, we are very much still in the midst of Cold War. About a million and a half men in the uniform are lined up on both sides of DMZ in Korea. We are very much in the midst of Cold War type confrontation between North Korea and South Korea. This year we are in the middle of 
the division which lasted for 54 years, since 1954. What I'm really saying is that for Korea, we are right in the middle of Cold War. But on the other hand, we have to deal with the world which is out of Cold War or in post-Cold War era. So we are dealing with the two different dimensions of the, uh, the current history. And that makes our situation extremely difficult. I guess many people have suffered different types of calamities and tragedies in the process of 20th century. But I think Koreans have suffered a great deal. Looking back to the history of the last 100 years, we feel that we have really suffered more than our share. As we entered 20th century, we were right in the middle of the age of imperialism. And Japan defeated China in 1895, and then defeated then Russia in 1905. And therefore, in 1910, Korea became a Japanese colony. And we stayed in such a status for 36 years. Then in 1945, we thought we were liberated. We were regaining our independence. But we found out immediately that we were divided by the agreement between the United States and Soviet Union. And as I said since then, for the last 54 years, we've been a divided country. And now next year, we will going to begin a three-year-long commemoration of the Korean War. The Korean War started, you may remember, June 25th, 1950. So next June, we start commemoration of 50th anniversary of Korean War. Now that war brought tremendous destruction, great many casualties. Just think about American involvement. Recently, we experienced such problem as Kosovo, the Kosovo operation. The President of the United States was trying to do his best to prevent a single, even a single American soldier being killed. And he largely succeeded. But 50 years ago, in the war in Korea, when the Americans came to help us to defend our freedom, 54,000 American lives were lost. That was the Korean War, 54,000. That's the, the, the Americans who came to help us. Now, how many Koreans lost their lives and how many destructions took place, I don't have to explain. So throughout the, the uh, 20th century, We've been suffering. In short, since 1910, we haven't had a single day in which Koreans enjoyed a unified, independent government. That's where we are. So we're still in the process of transition or crisis. What we are trying to do now is try to write successfully the last chapter, the last chapter in the history of the Cold War. In many ways, in that history, we and our allies, the free world, have scored a tremendous success. But still, the last chapter has to be written. And we are right in that process. Now, just uh, remember the, uh, the, the, where Korea is. I'm sure you have the uh, good sense of the map. 
But it's a very difficult neighborhood in which Korea is located. <laughs> Korea has only three neighbors, only three neighbors. You don't have many countries in Northeast Asia. Those three are China, Russia, and Japan. Now, Korea is not a small country. In South Korea today, we have 46 million people. In North Korea, 23 million people. So together, we have about 70 million Koreans in the Korean Peninsula. Now, if we were located in Western Europe, we are bigger than both France and United Kingdom. We are slightly smaller than United Germany. But what's big and small? It's all relative terms. 70 million people in our neighborhood is nothing when your immediate neighbor has 1.3 billion people. <laughs> China. And Korean Peninsula, as you look at the map, is a small place indeed when you compare to another neighbor, Russia, the vast land. Now, Korea is doing reasonably well in recent years economically. When you look at another neighbor, Japan, the Korean tourists feel that all the cash is in Japanese bank. So all in all, this is a very difficult neighborhood. I sometimes call it a very rough neighborhood to survive when you have these big neighbors. And it is in that sort of geopolitical setting, the Koreans are trying to maintain their, trying to maintain their independence, their identity, and also their prosperity. Now, North Korean system is a very special system. In some sense, it is a very successful system. That is, in the 20th century, there are many interesting phenomena. But one very important phenomenon had been a development of what you may call a totalitarian system, both on the right and on, on the left. On the left, you had the Stalinist system. On the right, you had the Hitler's Nazi system in Germany. Now, as you know, in textbook, totalitarian system is defined as a system in which one absolute ruler, one absolute party, one absolute ideology, total control and isolation of population. Now, North Koreans experimented with this system, and they succeeded. I think it's fair to say that North Korea had succeeded in building up almost textbook-like, most complete totalitarian system. One leader, one ideology, one party, total control of population, and total isolation of population. Now, so much so that once you build up a system like that, everybody, including the leadership, becomes prisoner of that system. System now controls everybody. Now, one important characteristic of that system is that system doesn't know how to change, how to make an adjustment. They feel that any effort to change it will bring total collapse of system. So they resist it. That's where we stand today. Now, this is a very special problem for the United States. As I told you, we now live, except in Korea, a post-Cold War era. And US found itself to be the sole superpower. That's a great thing. But now, a small state, particularly a totalitarian system like North Korea, developing the nuclear capability, the missile capability, biochemical weapons capability, what are you going to do with this system? I'm afraid at this stage, at least, we, that is, the United States and its allies, 
have not really developed intellectually or in terms of public policy a very good and adequate policy to deal with the situation. We just don't know what to do with it. So we're in a way struggling. And that's where we stand today. But in Korea, of course, this is really the most important security threat to the livelihood of Korean people. I think it's essential that the US and Korea maintain a very close alliance. I'll come back to this a little later. Now then, second crisis we are going through in Korea. At the end of the Korean War, as I told you earlier, we were completely devastated. Now some UN statistics says at the end of the Korean War, the per capita income in Korea was $60. Some says seventy dollars. I think I don't think there was any really clear uh, statistics, statistics. That's why many books say about one hundred one hundred dollars. I, I don't think that was the accurate uh, description. What is clear was that we are very poor. Now we have worked very hard in the sixties and seventies and eighties. And finally, four years ago, when I was serving as a prime minister, we finally reached the point where we had $10,000 per capita income. So if you started from $100, it means, well, 100 times. And that year, we, for the first time, exported $100 billion. And we were surprised ourselves that the OECD said, you are the now 11th largest economy in the world, so you got to join the club. We did. But in some sense, we didn't know what was really happening. It's not easy to move from the ranks of developing country to the membership in the developed countries clear that we cannot no longer say that we are very poor developing country. That's not true. So we joined OECD, but we didn't exactly know what are the requirements to be the member of OECD. And we didn't fully realize what was happening in the world at the end of the century. Now we thought, if you work very hard, many working hours, and manufacture, produce a good items, and you export them, then, well, you will get more income, more wealth. That's the best way to, to become rich. And that's what we did. And that's how we reached $10,000 per capita income. But in the last few years, the world economy is changing. It's not the manufacturing that really counts. It's the capital market. The world is rapidly becoming a single capital market. The capital is moving around the world, going over the national boundaries. And if you don't have a capacity, an institution, and strategy, to meet the requirements and challenges of global financial market, you cannot survive as a member of OECD. And we were not well prepared. So two years ago, when we were hit by so-called Asian financial crisis, we were surprised and we were somewhat defenseless. Suddenly, everything changed. For example, the exchange rate in November 1997, $1 meant 900 Korean won. Two months later, 
1800. I said we were a little over $10,000 per capita income. Suddenly, the UN says you're about $6,000. You see, that's what exchange rate does. Now, Korea was almost fully employed, less than 2% unemployed. Suddenly, you have 2 million people out of the job. All this happened overnight. Now, we faced a very gigantic task of meeting this new challenge, new crisis. Now, one thing helped us. As I told you, throughout the history, in a very rough neighborhood, we survived. So you might say Koreans, as a people, have little more experience or practice in facing challenges and crises, nothing new. So both the leadership and people realize that either we survive or else. So we have decided that however difficult it may be, we will stay in the game. We will not default. We will stay in game. We will pay whatever sacrifice is needed and will come out of this crisis. Now also we have received a tremendous help from the United States, from the IMF, from the, uh, the World Bank, and so on. So in the last two years, we have made a remarkable recovery. Now earlier, you heard my uh, personal history. I was a, uh, a prime minister under the previous president. Now, in December 97, in the first two weeks of the crisis, we had the presidential election. And the opposition leader, Mr. Kim Dae-jung, was elected. He is the current president. Now, as the chairman of the then ruling party, I didn't support him. In fact, we were trying to defeat him. But he won the election. And he is the president. But after he entered the, uh, the blue house, which is like your white house, he asked me to see him. And what he said is, look, this looks like we are on the verge of total bankruptcy. Let's work together. Let's overcome this crisis and then We'll see what we can do. So I accepted his appeal, and I decided to come over here in Washington to present a united front to American government, to IMF, to the World Bank, and to the financial community. And I'm delighted, as I said, we have made a very substantial recovery in the last year and a half. For example, when the crisis began in the first three months, our reserve was slightly less than $5 billion. For a country of our size, that's dangerously low. Now, a year and a half later, at the end of October, we have approximately $65 billion in reserve. Now, last year, we suffered minus 6% growth, not plus, minus. Because of that partially, you start from lower base. So this year, it looked like we're going to have 9% plus growth. But this is not just this year. Now, our Bank of Korea predicts that next two years, we're going to have about 5% growth every year which is good. So all in all, our economy is coming back. But as I told you, it's not a simple matter of recovery. What is needed is restructuring your economy, your society, to meet the challenges. You can no longer call yourself a poor developing country. 
you are a member of OECD. You have to be a full-time player in the global market. To meet these requirements, we are going through a very painful but wholesale restructuring. First, we restructured our banks. Every country has different culture, but in Korea, for a long time, banks were considered almost an extension of government. It's a public institution. In short, you don't make money with money. It's considered a bad thing. You make money only by working very hard, sweating. You don't make money by playing with your money. But that's what capital market is all about. So we have to change. It's not just simple institutional change. You have to change the value system. It's a good thing. You have to admire the bankers who play with money and bring in more money. That's what it's all about. So we are going through this process, and also we opened up. So one of our largest banks, for example, Korea First Bank, is taken over by a US fund called New Bridge Capital. By bringing in international banking, leadership institutions, we think we can make our institutions all more global and more competitive. Now we are in the process of restructuring our large companies, so-called chabers or conglomerates. Not easy. Because I'm sure you have gone through this experience locally and nationally. Restructure sounds good. But basically, it means, among other things, you fire lots of people. Very difficult process. But you have to do it or else. And we are now going through that process to make all the business accountable, transparent. We're changing our labor practice, labor union. With the democratization in the last 10 or 12 years, year after year, the increase in wage exceeded the increase in productivity. You cannot stay in the game. So we're changing that. And we are changing lots of public business into a private hands. So all of this restructure, we hope, will make us, in the next decade, next century, a full card-carrying member of OECD and successful competitor in a global market. Now, this requires, finally, a tremendous change in the people's value system and perspective. In the history book, Korea is recorded as hermit kingdom. Because until the end of 19th century, not very long ago, 100 years ago, Koreans generally declined or refused to deal with the outsiders, the foreigners. That's why Korea is recorded in history books as a hermit kingdom. The logic was simple. You're a smaller one in the neighborhood. As soon as you begin to have a more contacts, generally large ones will take over. So perhaps the best way to survive is not to have any relations. Hermit Kingdom. What we found out through all this experience in the 20th century is that in the next century, the best way to survive is not by isolating yourself, but becoming a forerunner, a frontrunner in the global movement. In terms of security, you cannot be secure alone. Only through alliance, you could really have security. You can prosper only by becoming a full member of global market. That's why we're changing from a hermit kingdom to a one of the forerunners in globalization. That's what we're trying to do. 
Now, in this process, we think we have become a really the best friend and ally of the United States, at least in Asia. As I said, 50 years ago, 54,000 American lives were lost in Korea to defend our country. We remember it, and we appreciate it. And that friendship is really basis of our alliance. But it's more than that, simple geopolitics. We have to maintain a balance among our neighbors. If any one of the three neighbors, be it Russia or China or Japan, become a hegemonic or dominant power in the region, we'll be in trouble. So we're trying to keep the balance. I think the U.S. interest and policy in Northeast Asia has the same objective. U.S. doesn't want to see any one of those three becoming an overwhelmingly strong power to dominate the scene. That spells trouble. So we as an inside power or inside balancer and U.S. as an outside balancer, together we could maintain balance among those three big neighbors and we're going to maintain peace, which will furnish foundation for the prosperity in Asia and also in the world. We're making good start. Among the number of things I have done, a most pleasant experience I had was to serve as the uh, chairman of the bidding committee for World Cup game. This is soccer game. And we successfully uh, bid to host the uh, 2002 World Cup game as co-host for the first time in the history of the Olympics or World Cup. Japan and Korea will co-host the game in year 2002. As I told you, we had a tremendous animosities and unfortunate history in the 20th century. But I felt and many of leaders and citizens in both countries felt that the best way to start next century is not as a old adversaries, but as close neighbors, so that we will make our neighborhood not a rough neighborhood, but rather pleasant neighborhood, and indeed play a major role in making the entire world a one global neighborhood. Thank you very much. We thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, the floor is now open for questions in the, in the rear. The question is, what actions do you think the United States has taken in the last few years which have either brought more stability or less stability to the region? Well, <clears throat> if I had to single out just one uh, development, that's uh, U.S. policy toward China. Anytime U.S.-China relations become a tense or sour, everybody in the neighborhood just feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so I think in the last few years, you have developed a reasonably good relationship. And I think as we go into the next century, it's vitally important that the relationship between U.S. and China remain cordial. And that provides a basic foundation upon which other relations could be built. But if U.S.-China relations become tense, relations between, for example, Japan and China would become very difficult. The, uh, the question, I think, is essentially what, <laughs> what is your view of, uh, of what your government might do under several contingencies, included among which are a change in administration? Well, first of all, as uh, 
Ambassador, you cannot really comment on American politics. <laughs> <coughs> uh, I like both Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> Actually, there is a tremendous continuity in U.S. policy toward Korea. As I told you, the war started back in 1950, when Mr. Truman was a president. And indeed, the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri, will have a special exhibition of some of the materials related to his decision back in 1950. But since then, you had both Democratic administration and Republican administration. And throughout all these years, we've been good friends. More recent years, we had a President Bush. We had a President Clinton. We had a President Carter. In fact, I'm going down to Atlanta on Thursday to have a big uh, uh, public discussion with the uh, former President Carter. But anyway, we don't expect any problem. Now, in some sense, these somewhat different emphasis, Democrats or current administration is trying to persuade North Koreans to come to terms with the general trend and asking them to make a certain adjustment, namely, halt any ambition to develop nuclear or missile capability, and become a part of regional and global ar arrangement, and try to make their economy progress so that North Korean population will enjoy greater welfare. That's the current administration position. We support it. Now, Chairman Gilman and others on the Republican side the other day have published North Korean study group report which strongly warn that unless North Koreans really make these changes, U.S. could not go on indefinitely, just give away things because so-called rogue state make a threat. That's not the way U.S. will operate in the future. I think this position also serves a very good purpose. The North Koreans should understand that U.S. is not doing all this because of its weakness, but rather because of its strength. So in fact, we are giving North Koreans now a time to make a choice. The next six months is very important as we go into the election year. It's North Koreans who have to show that they are willing to cooperate or else. That's the situation. Would you uh, discuss what Korea is going to do to commemorate the anniversary of the war? Well, <clears throat> of course, we do more commemoration than uh, the United States. I mean, the Korean War was an important event for the U.S., but for us, it was uh, really uh, the event. So there are so many things planned. Just take an example. In, incidentally, in the uh, U.S. government, there is a committee set up in the Pentagon, and the Department of Army is charged with this sp specific responsibility. We have our organization set up in our defense ministry, and these two organizations are coordinating some of the uh, activities. But just cite an example. I think next year, September 15th, there will be a big parade in Norfolk, Virginia. Marines around the country will gather for the 50th anniversary of Incheon Landing. This is a landing behind the enemy lines. And of course, at that time, the General MacArthur was still in charge. And you know, the Norfolk has the MacArthur Memorial, and so they're going to have that uh, parade there. Now, the other day, the, uh, the mayor of Incheon was here. So I told him that you should come with a large delegation to participate. But he said he couldn't come. That's the biggest event Incheon will have. 
the 50th anniversary of Incheon landing in Incheon. So obviously, Mayo has to be there. <laughs> so it just shows that on in both countries, there will be a, a really series of commemorative events, which I think will not only teach, in a way, a younger generation the history behind all this, and also see what are the values which we together had defended. The, uh, the question is, does Korea have any plans for a special honoring of American veterans of that war still alive? Well, in fact, that's one of the proposals we are very seriously considering at the moment. I was told that maybe uh, inaccurately, uh, some time ago, uh, that proposal was considered, uh, but uh, the, it was told uh, apparently uh, uh, by mistake that there was no precedent that the foreign government trying to honor everybody. So it was not uh, uh, done, but I think the next year will be the best and most appropriate occasion to do this. So we, we are, in fact, the committee is, in fact, the, uh, considering this proposal, yes. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm getting your question correctly, but concerning uh, North Korea's firing of missiles, which could appear to be threatening, has that had a positive influence upon your relationship with Japan? Well, Japan has become uh, very much agitated. And uh, in a way, that strengthened our cooperative relations by our, I mean, US, South Korea, and Japan. So for example, at this very moment, today and tomorrow, the delegation, or government officials from three governments are meeting in Washington to coordinate our common policy toward uh, North Korea. And of course, this created a tremendous amount of uh, sensitivity in Japan. So they're talking about such things as theater missile defense, TMD against the uh, North Korean missile. But then that brought a tremendous apprehension from the Chinese side. The interesting thing is all this is a sort of have a chain reaction. So we have reason to believe now that Chinese are advising North Koreans, take it easy. Because if you do it more, it will more or less push Japan to rearmament, which in turn will threaten China. So even Chinese, we have reason to believe, are cooperating with us, not directly, but try to check the, the, the North Korean development. So all in all, the, that missile had a, a tremendous impact. But on the other hand, from the North Korean viewpoint, it will be interesting to see how they feel. They might feel that only because they fired that missile, everybody is interested in North Korea now. <laughs> and they are willing to negotiate and maybe bring more food. Had not fired that missile, maybe no one would notice the problem there. So as I said, this is a new post-Cold War phenomenon. The US has the absolute supremacy. But when a smaller state with these capabilities create the problems and threats and challenges, how are you going to solve these problems? This is a new common challenge we face, and we have to give an answer to this. Could you give us a, a picture, perhaps, of the political machinations with respect to uh, um, reunification or not? First of all, there is a, a unanimous view, that is, no one wants to have another war. So even for unification, they don't want to have another war. That's why the only way we can proceed is to unify the country by peaceful means. That's a almost unanimous position. Now, how soon and what price you like to pay? Two things. First of all, there is a, such a discrepancy between North Korea and South Korea in terms of the well-being, the, the 
economy that obviously some South Koreans have become much more hesitant than in previous years. Secondly, particularly when you have your own share of problems, like two million people out of a job, for the man on the street, the priority is to revive our economy and to make further progress, not so much the unification. Now, on the other hand, as I said, as a nation, as a people, we have suffered so much that it's doesn't need any emphasis that they all feel that number one priority as a nation and as a people is to reunite the country. And we have five million people who came down from north. So if they left one member family in the north, that's already 10 million people. And you cannot postpone the reuniting the family on account of expense. My Conclusion on the basis of all this is that we are not artificially trying to hurry the process. We'll proceed gradually, peacefully. But if there came a chance to unify the country, we will take it, even if it means a tremendous cost which everybody has to share. Because, again, as a people, that's the question or problem of pride and national heritage. But going a step further, I have done my share of uh, analysis and study. And while the unification cost will be tremendous, people often forget how great is division cost, maintaining the current division. As I said, you have to maintain a million and a half people men in the uniform, with all this armament, just to maintain this, the cost is enormous. So again, if we get lucky, as Germans did 10 years ago, Germans just got lucky, because Chancellor Kohl didn't know it was coming six months before the German unification. It just came. So I think it's almost providential. We're hoping that before too long, we'll get lucky, and we'll get reunited. Now, two questions. Um, the first is, do you have some kind of paradigm or model of theoretical explanation of how you bring together, uh, on one hand, the cold, uh, ending the Cold War, the last chapter you described, uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, dealing with uh, the so-called post-Cold War era, the first the theoretical question. The second is the question of uh, what is unique about um, North Korea as opposed to other rogue states, and is the approach usually taken by the United States, uh, which tends to be military or, or involve embargoes, is that relevant uh, to North Korea? The short version of that question, I think, is what is the unique policy approach to uh, North Korea? Well, <clears throat> even if I have an answer on, on the intellectual side, I think it's not an appropriate place to, uh, to really discuss this because it will require, require a longer time. And another thing is all these intellectual answers, they sound good, but they are, uh, <laughs> when it really comes down, uh, uh, every option is a rather questionable. The, uh, the, Secondly, the, the difference between the Korean situation and, for example, the Middle Eastern situation, as you have pointed out, Korea is right in the middle of three important big powers. Now, any reopening of hostilities there immediately involve everybody into the action. You remember the war came to an and an inconclusive end only because the Chinese intervened. And China is so close, I don't think they could stay away. So this will uh, really complicate the issue uh, uh, tremendously. Furthermore, as you yourself have mentioned, the, the amount of destruction and casualty will be uh, so enormous, there's no real comparison. For example, the city of Seoul, our capital, 
have about 11 million people, the population of the city of Seoul. Now, how far is Seoul from the, the, the front line? The front line is the Panmunjom, where the, the, the truth talk has taken place. It's roughly equal to a distance between the United States capital to the Dallas airport. That's why, for example, Koreans don't show any interest in theater missile defense. <laughs> you ask men on the street, they say, well, it doesn't make any difference whether you are hit by artillery or by missile. <laughs> and since we, everybody lives on the artillery range, no need to spend more money to defend the, uh, the attack by missile. So this is a very, very special situation. The conclusion, again, you need strength, deterrence. Lesson we learn from, again, the 50 odd years of Cold War. Only when you are strong, you could maintain the peace. Then you got to have a tremendous patience. You have to exercise a great deal of patience, wait. And then, of course, in the final analysis, as I said, you got to get a help from above, or you just got to be lucky. Would you make a comparison between the economic state of the North Koreans and the South Koreans? Well, I don't really have uh, the figures because in recent years I had given up because it has very little meaning. The North Korean economy has collapsed almost totally. For example, North Korean agriculture, they said it's bad weather. But year after year, they suffer from the shortage of food. Without the help from our side, the millions of people have to die. Why? Simply, the, it has been proven that collective farms don't produce. In every country, it has been shown that collective farms don't work. So the North Korean economy is on the verge of total collapse. And that's why I think one of the reasons why maybe out of desperation, they are coming to the conference table, to negotiation table. Nevertheless, we hope that we could utilize this opportunity to persuade North Korean leadership that the only way you can really survive is by opening up, be more reasonable, and follow the example of others. You don't have to go very far. The immediate neighbor, China, is still under the leadership of the Communist Party. Yet, by opening up and by mingling with the outside world, in the last 10 or 15 years, Chinese have tremendously increased the welfare level for the Chinese population. If Chinese could do it, why couldn't North Korea? So we're just trying to persuade them with a great deal of patience to some extent with the sincerity. But also, you have to show them that what are the alternatives. And there, you need a strength. And that's why earlier I said, you have different positions in the United States, but all these positions sometimes help the solution one way or another. Given uh, the economic disparity between South and North Korea, is it necessary for American troops to remain? Yes. <clears throat> Just take uh, the uh, more immediate reason, which nowadays are uh, very fashionable to discuss, the nuclear weapons. If we are left alone, for example, the only way we can survive in the neighborhood is developing our own nuclear capability to counter North Korea and to defend ourselves against Chinese. But this is precisely what the United States is trying to avoid. If we have a few bombs, I don't think Japanese could just stay idle. 
they got to do something. That's the surest way the entire region will become engulfed into a, a crisis. That's just one of the reasons. And that's why we are saying that even after the unification, maybe not 37,000, but some contingent of US forces will stay in Korean Peninsula as a balance in the neighborhood where balance is very much needed. Now, in the past, going back to the first half of, of this century and even going back to 19th century, US wanted to play the role of balancer, but didn't have any help inside the region. And it's very difficult to achieve that objective from outside. You need an ally there. And that's the role the Republic of Korea or South Korea is playing at the moment. And at least personally, I think we're going to play that role even after the unification. Now, in recently, for example, we are the ones who perhaps first Asian country which unconditionally supported U.S. action in Kosovo. In East Timor, even in our country, there was some objection to send troops down there because Indonesians at first didn't like it. Outsiders come in to East Timor. We have a tremendous investment in Indonesia. That's one of the, not the biggest reason, but one of the small reasons. That is, we made too much investment both in Indonesia and in Russia. And I think in both places, it will be difficult to really uh, collect those loans for many years to come. But in any case, since we have that much investment, since we have some Korean residents in Indonesia, it was not easy for us to go into the East Timor against the express wishes of Indonesians. But we felt that this is the question of principle, and this has been the way we defended our common values. So we sent our troops down there. What I'm really saying is that US in Europe has a very strong ally in the United Kingdom. In a very difficult situation, UK has performed a role of the closest ally in Western Europe. At this juncture of history, we think we could be the closest ally of the United States in Asia Pacific, and together we could keep the region in terms of both peace and prosperity. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, we, we simply thank you for an absolutely